Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CIN webinar, Extended Reality Technology Treatment for Behavioral Health. This webinar explores the theory, evidence, challenges, and, and potential applications for extended reality for treating behavioral health conditions. My name is Marie Hubbard, and I'm the Program Manager for the California Improvement Network, also known as CIN. CIN is a learning and action network that works to advance the quadruple aim by identifying, spreading better ideas for care delivery. CIN is fueled by the energy and innovations of its partners and members, and it's the only network in California that brings together commercial and safety net provider organizations, health plans, and quality improvement instructional hubs. CIN is a project of the California Healthcare Foundation and managed by Health Force Center at UCSF. The California Healthcare Foundation is dedicated to advancing meaningful, measurable improvements in the way the healthcare delivery system provides care to the people of California, particularly those with low incomes and those whose needs are not well served. Health Force Center at UCSF is an organization dedicated to helping healthcare organizations drive and navigate change. Health Force Center efforts are focused in the core areas of capacity building, leadership development, and workforce research. So a few tech tips uh, before we get started. Everyone is on mute except for our presenter. If you would like to ask a question or share a comment, you can do so by doing in the chat box or the Q&A box, both located in the bottom panel of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can within the hour. This webinar will be recorded and we'll be sharing the recording afterwards. If you have any immediate questions or are having technical issues, please message my colleague, Christina Trablos, and she can help you. So now I'll introduce our presenter, Dr. Kim Bullock, a clinical professor in the Psychiatry and Behavioral Health Sciences Department at Stanford University. She primarily focuses her research in exploring the use of technology, particularly immersive technologies for telepsychiatry for trauma treatment and psychiatric illnesses. So I'll now pass it off to Dr. Bullock to get us started. Well, thank you very much. I am going to get my slides on. And um, I'm so excited to talk to this um, organization. And um, I want to join now. I mean, I love the idea of a um, network. Um, and innovation. It's totally, I, I feel like everything gets done by a network of conversations. So I'm hoping this conversation uh, will help all of us in all the possibilities and opportunities that we're creating. Um, and anyway, I am uh, basically uh, a psychiatrist. Most of my day um, is uh, delivering psychotherapy and pharmacological um, interventions. Um, but I'm also a neuropsychiatrist and so um, have a, a little bit uh, deeper roots in neurology and also see patients that are kind of at the interface of neurology and, and psychiatry. Um, and I am going to talk to you about XR and hopefully at the end of this, um, we will um, have you have a better um, knowledge about the clinical evidence of XR and understand the neuroplasticity and the potential for um, its use, the, the human nervous system and the XR um, technology and, and how it affects neuroplasticity, as well as just inspire you to what the potentials are about the applications, especially to uh, telehealth. And then to you know, talk about the need and ways that we can more effectively collaborate uh, to make these innovations and improvements happen. So let's see, I'm trying, I'm just getting used to the technology here. Okay, I found my next button. All right. Uh, so we've broken it down into four components. Uh, uh, but again, um, we're, I'm first, there's a lot to cover. So I'm going to talk pretty fast and furiously, and I'm going to probably not go with, uh, um, I'm more going to have a broad view of things than a deep one, but we can explore deeper issues that you need to through our conversation today as well. Um, but I'm going to review the XR basics and then the mental health um, traditional VR um, uh, just a little bit, and then really dive into the more novel um, XR embodied uh, um, 
experiences and immersive technologies and what they have to offer and then open it up for discussion but we'll pause along the way um, so you can uh, also ask questions um, so don't be frightened by the name xr extended reality um, i kind of you know i've been in this field now for 10 years and i saw this i'm like I, what is extended reality have i missed the boat is this some new technology and my career is over but really i think um the thing to think about is it's a new umbrella term i it's really replaced the term um immersive technology uh, and um i think um it it encompasses just think about it as, as a company encompassing all the immersive technologies and anything in the future. So I'm going to just go over some of the basic ones, which are uh, uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality. We'll start with virtual reality. Uh, but more, I think XR is just uh, um, there. So we're not, uh, we've been hearing so much about VR. We're kind of getting oversaturated. So I think they needed a new term. It might be more of a marketing um, issue to use the term XR, but just don't be afraid of it. Um, so the main issue uh, with VR for you to remember um, is that it really is, um, it takes you to another place and it's generated usually by a computer uh, with at least a 3D image and um, is a pretty immersive, usually takes up the whole visual field um, and brings you to a perspective that's usually life-size in nature. So that's the usual um, experience that's generated by virtual reality. Um, and it involves it replacing uh, reality uh, with a computer simulated reality um, that is involved with um, just taking in head movements is the only part of actual reality that's being uh, used to create a simulated uh, computer version. And um, it does this by measuring the yaw roll and pitch, the X, Y, and Z um, axis. Uh, so basically it takes away visual reality that usually informs our, our experiences, our thoughts, and our emotions, and it replaces it with a simulated computer generated version just using um, your position of your head. Um, and so one thing I just wanted to quickly go over is a sense of presence. Uh, and so that is just a term um, that is really um, connoting uh, your sense of being there. And there's different ways of being somewhere. You can be um, taken to uh, a different social uh, situation. As there, there's a sense, sense of actually being a different social interaction, um, which is a, a social presence. You can be in a spatial presence where you're a sense of actually being in a different location and space. And then there's a, a sense of presence about your own body, actually being in a different body. Um, and so this, you'll hear the term presence. I don't want that to uh, be intimidating as, as well. It's just a term um, that's used uh, to also measure the robustness of devices and experiences uh, in an ecological validity uh, way. So how quickly somebody has a sense of presence um, can, can determine the, the power of a device. Uh, so it's, it's used as a gold standard. Um, and it also seems to be a marker of positive if it, uh, uh, experiences ability to positively transfer skills from a virtual environment to um, actual environment. So it's the robustness of its ability to actually teach. Um, Trying to get my camera in a place so I can see my slides. I'm sorry, I'm still becoming, learning the skill of Zoom and PowerPoint <laughs> interfaces. And then the term immersion, just quickly, it's just how quickly you can create a sense of presence. So usually because of our multimodal uh, perceptual system, we can do this in as little as five to six seconds with really good technology. It was just, just remarkable to, to me. You can become immersed in, in this so quickly. And uh, one of the things I just also want you to remember is um, what's so transformative about this technology is the, its ability to force perspective. So as um, a therapist, when I'm doing therapy, a narrative kind of therapy, often what we're trying to do through language is get people to take different perspectives. What was it like for you? What was it like for the other person? What is this like in a historical perspective? 
Um, and we don't have to do that with language in, in a VR experience. You can force a of, of being experiencing something through the first person, just like a novel um, would be a first person experience. And, um, or you can force a second person experience so you can actually watch the, your interaction and, and your behavior through another person's point of view. Um, and then there's the third person. So you can actually have an outside view of an interaction between you um, and the world. Um, and so these kind of, at least in journaling and language, we know um, have some effect on emotion regulation, theory of mind, all sorts of possibilities um, occur when you're able to manipulate uh, perspectives. Um, so in a, in a sense, um, it's a, I think of it as a, a prosthetic for imagination. Um, so we're all often trying to get explicitly patients to imagine things, and here we can do it for them. Um, and so, Right now, um, the traditional VR, there's uh, many, many devices. Uh, one of the simplest is Google Cardboard that's quite effective for just a few dollars, um, but you can get as fancy as something like the Daydream um, and uh, Samsung. Um, uh, but then there's also augmented reality. So this is where you layer virtual information and you either add information or you take it away. So you can block some part of reality uh, with, um, you know, a HoloLens or your iPad, or even now the phone is possible uh, can do this, where you can add or take away um, information from reality. So that's augmented reality. So I just wanted um, to get a, a primer very briefly about what the types of uh, immersive technologies in XR are out there, and, and we'll be talking more about this in depth. Um, and then very quickly, the uses in behavioral health. So this has been studied, traditional VR has been really around for almost 30 years, which I was kind of, um, uh, my mind was kind of blown because I never learned this in my medical training or my psychiatric training, um, mostly by experimental and clinical psychologists. Um, but basically uh, you could lump the uses of uh, immersive technology, at least in the last couple decades, into four categories. Um, it's being used as a tool um, uh, and, and an augmentation to exposure therapies. So you can use it to desensitize to cues, um, to help with conditioning or habituation. To um, Some people have sensory integration issues and need uh, sensitize perhaps to tactile information on their skin. Um, or it can be used to prevent um, stress or something traumatic in the future. So, um, for example, being, it's being used to help pediatric patients prepare for um, cardiac surgery, and, and so they're not, um, so they're, they get used to it, and it's not as emotionally stressful. Uh, and then also distraction, that was one of the first uses um, for acute pain in burn victims, what uh, um, uh, Hoffman used this, Hunter Hoffman, uh, in a game called Snow World. Um, and now it's being used even more for procedures. Um, I know our, at, at Stanford, uh, the chariot program in pediatric uses it quite a bit to help kids get through painful procedures. But it can also be used for emotional distress, for getting through um, a very um, short-term um, suffering. Um, and because the visual system uh, is so robust and um, there's so much real estate in the nervous system that is um, really um, for vision, it can override other sensations. Um, and I think that's the beauty of the, the visual format for uh, virtual reality. But it also can be used as distraction and sensory stimulation for sensory deprivation situations, especially uh, for people that um, are in nursing homes, getting pseudo-dementia or uh, depression. Um, and we'll talk more about that as well. Um, there's training. One of the very um, important uses it's being used for is enhancing learning. So it's a multimodal uh, uh, for all kinds of learning styles um, and it can enhance uh, retention of material um, and it's much more engaging. 
Um, and then it can be used in research. So uh, in controlled trials, you can control experiences and variables, such as standard instances and cues. You can use it as well for um, measuring things like eye tracking or avoidance behavior. Um, so it's being used, um, um, so traditionally over the, the last three decades, it's used, being used in, in, many, in kind of those four buckets, I, I would say, in general. Um, and then the other thing to know um, is that it's been used in a, a, um, all the, uh, uh, most of the uh, major psychiatric illnesses. Um, there are randomized um, controlled trials uh, which, with good results um, showing that it's not inferior to a traditional cognitive behavior therapy. So we have quite a few um, controlled trials. Um, and so this got me interested in um, incorporating VR into my, uh, a lot of my CBT practice. So we opened up a virtual reality um, clinic, which just meant we just happened to have some tools. Um, it wasn't like we're delivering the entire therapy virtually, but that we could use these tools when we needed them. So I did a lot of research into different vendors and platforms, and I actually only found one um, that fit our need and seemed ready for prime time and, and was easily usable. I don't have any conflicts of interest or um, any financial ties with them. I just subscribed to their service for about $1,000 a year. Um, and I guess I can say, say the, the name. Uh, I guess we don't have any reason not to say. But uh, anyway, it's Sias is the platform we're using right now. Um, it's based in Spain. Um, but it has all, what I like, it was designed by clinicians. It has all the evidence-based protocols. It's web-based. Um, it's on a platform that's mobile. Um, and so, um, anyway, this is kind of what the platform looks like. And so I'll just give you some examples very quickly of, uh, ways that, um, it's used in the clinic, uh, mostly with anxiety disorders since, a, a third of people experience an anxiety disorder at some point. Um, point. Um, and I find one of the most useful ways that this platform is used is helping me do exposure um, in CBT. And, and in case we've got non clinicians here, um, that anxiety, the mechanism of anxiety for most anxiety disorders involves some level of avoidance or safety behavior. So the more you avoid something, um, the more anxiety you get, which is great when you're in the savanna and you're trying to avoid, you know, a lion, you see a cave, you avoid the lion's cave, you become more anxious and you move farther and farther away from that danger. Uh, but when it comes to um, the 21st century living and uh, you start to do avoidance behaviors that are maladaptive, you can get into trouble. You could avoid second story buildings um, that are not dangerous and you can't visit your friends or uh, you can't go to work. Um, and so um, that kind of avoidance is really maladaptive. So what you've got to do is get people to avoid avoiding and stop the safety behaviors. And so, um, uh, so you can turn down anxiety by doing exposure and you get this desensitization. So really what's happening in the brain during this is you get um, an altered responsivity of amygdala activity through um, and this hyperactive limbic and prefrontal cortical brain regions um, get altered. And so we do this. So we do this by talk therapy and having people do exposures, um, but we're also doing this. We're modulating the nervous system with these exposures um, in session. Um, so it is, in a sense, kind of um, brain surgery without scalpels. Um, and so traditionally, I would be in the clinic and I would have a patient try to imagine what their feared uh, uh, situation is and then, um, you know, try to help them cope imaginally and then hope to God that they go and do the actual in vivo exposure. Uh, but uh, it's really hard to do. And when people are really um, scared, they, they have trouble eliciting that frontal lobe to imagine. And they're, they're um, um, so... Um, you get a dropout of about 25% in most exposure type uh, therapies. And what I found um, doing it in virtuo, um, although th this has not been documented yet, there, um, there are some studies looking at dropout, but I wish I had some data that could really 
um, back this up, but it's not there yet. Um, but I don't think that means there. It, um, it's not, um, it doesn't help drop out. It's just, we have not done the rigorous studies yet. But what the in virtuo does is it forces the imagination, again, like a prosthetic for the imagination. So a person can elicit this, um, these cues imaginally without, uh, or simulated, simulated before they go out and do the real thing. So it's kind of palliative so that they can desensitize a little before they actually go out and do the, the real exposure that they eventually need to do, which is, you know, maybe go to the second floor of a building. Um, so um, anyway, the, the main take home points with anxiety is that, um, you know, it's not inferior to um, traditional um, uh, CBT. Uh, and then the dropout rates may be lower. Um, and there's lots of opportunities. There's still a lot of um, disorders that have not been explored adequately or rigorously, including obsessive compulsive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. So there's lots of room um, for um, continuing research on this. Um, and I think, I think it will be coming, especially as this becomes more common, um, the use of technology. Um, and then we also use in the clinic, uh, SIAS has this, but almost everybody has access to some kind of augmented reality. Um, you know, with spiders, you can simulate spiders with augmented reality on your iPad or your iPhone. Um, but you know, what's really interesting is the thing that I use most because so many people's um, cues and fears are so idiosyncratic and you need to personalize and customize things is there's so much content on YouTube 360 uh, videos, we just use Google Cardboard and have patients find that the cues that are actually scary to them and go home and use them or do them in the session as well. Um, so, and that's completely free. Um, and so um, the other area that we're using um, most often is our eating disorders. Um, you know, one in 20 people will be affected. It can be fatal in many cases, especially with anorexia. And um, there's been a, a lot of uh, research and uh, uh, efficacy as well as, um, especially in folks that have uh, failed traditional CBT, uh, exposure therapy using VR has been shown to be superior um, to ongoing CBT. Um, so. In traditional CBT, we really go after three things for eating disorders, uh, redu uh, you know, reducing the desire or impulse towards food or towards avoidance of foods. So you're using exposure therapy in different ways based on what's going, what's the problem with the patient. It also, um, uh, we try to get people to get more correct in their size distortion. Um, so often they have distortions like, I think I'm really big, or for some people, they underestimate. Think uh, you know their BMI isn't that bad when they really do have a high BMI and they need to change their health health behaviors. Um, so it helps in adjust. So we try to get people to correct their size distortions, and uh, uh, VR has been shown to be helpful in that. And I'm going to talk a little bit later more um, also with this embodied um, XR um, reducing body dissatisfaction. Um, is also um, being explored, and there's some um, really um, interesting things happening in that regard. But the more evidence-based ones about size distortion and exposure, we're able to do on a size platform. Um, and, uh, the, and then the next uh, most common use of VR at, um, in most clinical settings is for um, psychosis, interestingly enough. Um, and it's mostly uh, involving, the, and, and this has been more recently, some really um, uh, rigorous trials that have shown that it helps uh, with uh, success in employment and social functioning. Um, and this is done through exposure um, to what are thought for people with psychosis, uh, uh, what they think is threatening and getting exposure to it. Like it might be looking someone in the eye or or reappraising. So there's um, a lot of uh, programs that can help you do that or just tolerate the distress of having your hallucinations present. Um, yeah, but I think there's also room for the cognitive enhancement therapy that's been shown for executive training could be also placed in a VR um, or XR format. So there's, uh, there's room for development there. 
Um, so these are some of the scenarios and what they look like, like on a subway, you get, um, so people get used to being around other people. This is also used for social phobia and any other ways you wanna use. And although the controlled trials for substance use disorder um, besides tobacco use have not been completed, we think that there's, they're probably um, going to be um, quite robust. Uh, you can teach uh, refusal skills, you can desensitize people to their cues who have substance use disorders. Um, and then mood disorders, uh, there's not as much uh, research about that, but you definitely, and, um, teach skills that are helpful for depression, such as mindfulness and relaxation strategies. Um, and um, I'll talk about behavioral activation. We're, we're using VR to help people um, with behavioral activation. Um, and then there, um, the platform we have also has some pain reduction um, and mindfulness strategies. Um, and so uh, what we're, we've been doing in the clinic even before uh, COVID is uh, uh, we did do a, a subset of patients remotely using VR. So as long as they can take the headset home, um, I, uh, a provider can control it remotely, what they are um, experiencing with a VR headset. Um, and they also can, when they have it at home, uh, practice and uh, um, it is recorded and then I can see how much they're complying with homework. And we know that for most CBT, for most disorders, the one variable that really outcome is the amount of homework and practice a person does. So here we can really measure how much practice is done, especially in, in exposure-based practices. So um, yeah, and here, and so we've developed a, a, a clinic. It's um, of the people uh, with providers that have actually um, um, do uh, are using VR in our clinics um, and you can find us on the website um, as well but maybe I'll stop here and take some questions that kind of give you a little primer of yeah thanks Kim um, we don't have any questions yet so I'll just uh, send a reminder to the group that uh, you're welcome to ask questions at any time you can use the chat or the QA box located at the bottom panel of your screen uh, we'll be pausing throughout the next uh, 30 minutes of this webinar just to see if anyone has any questions. So feel free to put them in and we'll keep track and ask them as they come in. Okay, okay, great. All right, yeah, there's a lot to cover. There's a, this is such a, a fun topic, but there's so much uh, to talk about. Um, so let's go move on to uh, the more recent developments, especially with, um, uh, gaming devices and um, with um, some of the uh, major Oh, Kim, you it looks like you Sorry, yes, sorry about that. There we go. Um, Don't know where. Uh, uh, yes, so there's been a revolution. Um, we now can um, have body transfer experiences. Like this is just mind blowing. It's still, every time I talk about it, that's like a day-to-day -day occurrence now. It just blows me away that we, uh, you know, this is like, if anyone's seen the movie, um, being John Malkovich, like we can actually enter and feel that we are in another body. And this used to only be possible uh, through a very expensive laboratories and universities uh, with head, very heavy headsets. But because of the gaming industry, uh, especially with the onset of the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, you can have these body transfer experiences anywhere in any space. And what's different about this compared to just the head tracking traditional VR um, that's been around is that you now replace visual reality with complete um, body movement, not just head tracking. And you, you use that to uh, simulate and you can then modulate not only cognition and emotion, but sensation and sense of movement. So you, it, it gets, it ties into another feedback loop in the perceptual system. And I'll try to explain it a little bit more um, in uh, more detail as we go on. Um, and a lot of our understanding about embodiment um, and XR is really based on embodiment illusion research that's been going on. Um, 
for many decades and usually using perceptual illusions. And one of the, uh, a few things to remember in that is that because of the dominance of vision uh, we, in creating uh, uh, your body schema, um, manipulation of, of that perception um, can actually create these body uh, transfer experiences. Um, and, and because probably uh, because of tool use, we, we are, you know, quickly, we are so responsive, our perceptual systems uh, to, to this, they're, they're so plastic and they remap immediately the motor and sensory cortex that, you know, we can, we can learn an, in a matter of moments how to inhabit a lobster and control eight arms. I mean, like we, we have a phenomenal multimodal perceptual system. Um, and if anyone wants to try it, one of my favorite is high fidelity. It's a game. If you have a, a gaming device that allows, um, immersive and embodied experiences, I, I recommend that it allows you to experience, to fly, to be a different person. Um, and so, um, some of medicine has been in on this and, um, there are a good rigorously tested uses of embodied VR that have just come on the scene in the last decade for stroke rehabilitation. So it seems to be help with engagement and amount of practice for doing physical therapy. Um, it's also used uh, especially for motor skills training for surgeons, spine and gross motor skills are so often part of the procedure. It's been used for balance um, in Parkinson's and is um, also for cerebral palsy, mostly in children. Uh, uh, so, and some areas of ex exploration, I think, and some things to think about, uh, just concepts that come up when you um, think about embodiment illusions, is that people with decreased interoceptive sensitivity seem to have more profound and are able to um, increase propensity for embodiment and body transfer experiences. Um, and this is a, also a marker for emotion regulation and for many psychiatric illnesses, this decreased sense of being able to sense perceptions, um, internal sensations, and, and often they can't label emotions as well because of that, and there's regulation issues. Um, and so I, I think given that we may have ways and tools of using this to help regulate emotions, uh, but, but we have to be aware of this. Um, and then the other issue is that there's so much that we don't know. We also, we need to be very careful and we need to rigorously test this and we need clinicians and medicine and researchers because um, systems like the immune system may be linked in ways that, that may be detrimental if we spend too much time in VR. So we know from embodiment illusions that the disembodied body part um, has an increased um, immune um, and histamine reactivity, which may indicate that we start to reject parts of our body when we disembody from them and during these illusions. Um, so um, one of the first uses of um, a, a, an embodied uh, um, actual embodied illusion was the amputation of phantom limb by Ramachandran at, at UC San Diego. Um, interesting, he, uh, yeah, he was one of um, the reasons I went to medical school many years ago when I wasn't, didn't even know about VR. Um, but he uh, studied perceptual illusions. And so he, and he was also a neurologist, and he really, um, you know, honed into the fact that the visual system and movement really inform sensation. And it makes evolutionarily, evolutionarily sense because if you're not moving a limb, you're in trouble and you should probably immobilize. And, and um, so, you will feel more pain. If you're in pain and you stop moving, the body's like, this is an emergency. We should probably not move. Let's send her more pain so she won't move anymore. So um, that makes total sense when you're needing to recover. But for many disuse syndromes, um, including amputations, the lack of seeing movement then creates this vicious loop of pain and no movement, and there's no way to get movement on board. 
or for people who are in so much pain they can't move anymore. So the way to break that pattern is to create a sense of movement. Often, if you can create it without pain, do it an illusion, that can be even more profound. And you can turn down the sensations that are bothersome, but, uh, most, mostly pain. And so mere visual feedback has been used and studied quite rigorously and found to be efficacious in many mo unilateral motor and sensory um, syndromes, almost all of them that have been studied. Um, and one of the reasons I'm bringing it up here and want to make a big deal about it is many uh, providers um, have not been educated about this. And they're not prescribed, even if they have, they're not prescribing it. And I don't know why. And I'm wondering if you could put it in a, in a virtual format or use technology or in some way, um, people might start to use it more. But I don't know why uh, mere visual feedback is so underutilized. So, and it, it, not only do we have the evidence that it works, we know the mechanism even. I mean, how, how many things in neurology and psychiatry do we even know the mechanism? We know that um, when you get um, incongruence and there's an expectancy violation, you get areas of the dorsolateral prefrontal and, um, and posterior cingulate cortex activated and you get priming for learning. So attention and con cognitive control go up. So that um, so it allows shaping to occur and conditioning. Um, you get mirror neuron network um, activation. Um, but even more exciting to me is you actually get plasticity in a primary motor cortex, the M1, that projects to the body part. So you are actually, you know, illusions are creating changes in the nervous system. Um, so I got very interested in this, um, in applying this to some of my conversion um, patients because um, that many of them have unilateral motor and sensory symptoms. So if you don't know what conversion disorder is, it's kind of a psychosomatic illness in which people have neurological symptoms, but it's not due to a medical or a neurological um, disease process. Um, and um, Often it's uh, a part of an emotion regulation um, deficit that instead of feeling emotions, um, their amygdala hijacks these motor and sensory cortex areas and causes um, motor and sensory symptoms. So the person can come in, uh, they're very stressed and they might be paralyzed on the left side, yet they um, have no neurological reason um, and um, many of the exams uh, on a physical exam, they won't show any deficits. Um, and they'll actually show signs of, of conversion functional neurological disorder. So anyway, we, I started to apply this to those folks, as well as some of my cerebral palsy and um, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis patients anecdotally, um, and they were getting some good outcomes, um, such as decreased pain, um, decrease in abnormal sensations, improved dystonias um, and so I got uh, so then I decided I want to study this and in a controlled fashion and, and am I just making this up is this just placebo um, and so and a couple of things that I think are important for um, stakeholders to think about is XR it's any kind of skills and um, especially in the immersive embodied experiences you're going to get even more enhancement and learning um, and then the very, very important takeaway is that you can reprogram implicit, um, Im implicit behaviors uh, and cognitions and beliefs. Uh, so most in uh, mental health and behavioral health now, most of the treatment involves getting patients to explicitly do skills to change, right? So virtual reality, um, does can help a person change uh, without consciously having to put effort, so a passive kind of changing. And there is a danger in this in that um, it, you have to make sure you have consent and you can do this without someone's consent. Um, and uh, so, uh, many of the social scientists that are studying this, like Jeremy Balinson's lab, uh, really documented something called the Proteus effect. So whatever avatar that you embody, whatever characteristics it has, you tend to take those characteristics with you and act 
similar to that when you leave. So if you're a superhero, um, you inhabit a superhero um, or an experience, the week after you're going to be more helpful than somebody that did not inhabit the body of a superhero. Um, and it changes implicit biases towards race and homelessness or whatever characteristic that you have embodied experience. Um, and it can change people's political beliefs. Um, so there's, there's a lot of potential there. Um, it also, because of this forced Alice-centric viewpoints, it can bring on empathy um, and um, compassion, um, help with theory of mind deficits and autism. Um, and so um, the, and then the other issue is Alice-centric lock theory. It, uh, because our sense of body is determined by an allocentric viewpoint. It's uh, what we think we look like to others, as well as our egocentric sensations. They come together and create our sense of our body and our satisfaction about our body. But for some people, they, uh, they never update that. So maybe a way that somebody looked at them when they were in third grade and said that they were ugly, they see themselves as ugly. From, and it never gets it never gets updated. This negative stored memory, and so VR and body swapping illusions looks like um, from some of the research that you can actually alter um, some of that um, implicit biases and self objectification that goes on. So, for example, um, uh, Giuseppe Riva has a study of a, um, several cases of overweight uh, person going into a VR experience inhabiting uh, a normal weight uh, avatar. You would think that that would cause them to feel worse about their body afterwards, right? But paradoxically and ironically, they, after uh, those avatar experiences, they feel better and have more body satisfaction. And then um, started, this started to translate into improved um, health behaviors. So there's, there's lots of uh, research indicating um, um, the potential use of XR, especially for implicit biases. So we talked about mirror therapy, integration with biofeedback, physical therapy, body image, and we haven't even touched on uh, teletherapy yet, but uh, I would Im imagine, you can imagine um, that teletherapy could also be done, group therapy. Um, there's more, um, it, by being spatially in a space together and socially interacting and having presence, um, you're going to have a more um, immersive experience uh, and a more more valence to uh, whatever you're doing. Um, and so, as far as XR and telehealth, um, I think it can be you can think of it in in three ways. There's you could use XR to remotely um, diagnose folks. So you, if somebody's wearing um, an um, uh, an immersive technology, you might be able to measure things like range of motion. I know there are some VR games in which spatial, they can detect uh, spatial deficits early um, and they ac accurately predict dementia onset. Um, there's XR prescriptions you could do remotely as well. So maybe I could you know, deliver physical therapy or cognitive therapy or relaxation skill. Um, and then you can use XR for the actual platform itself for telehealth. So there's many different permutations. You can have 2D avatars, 3D avatars, mixed reality. You could, there could be cost savings and you have a, a, a radial office and you could have mixed reality and it could look like it's remodeled and you have this great ocean view and save tons of money um, on office space, let's say. Um, and then, this is mind blowing to me is holoportation. And this is not just theory, this is real. I've had two vendors now show me this. You can get videographic quality. And I think Microsoft is also working on this where you can bring two people with videographic, um, 3D um, videographic quality, real time video. So it feels as if you're in the same space together. Um, uh, so, um, and you can use this, you could imagine you could use this in a provider patient interaction, you could use this in group therapy, or you could also use it in consultation. I'm sure you could think of many other healthcare uh, ways that you could use this. But we do need to be aware that there are barriers. One of them is cost. So there, 
so far, there, um, at least in my experience with uh, cost, there's no direct improvement in cost. Um, there may be indirect unless, you know, if you're getting more people who are, you know, it's a marketing tool or if you could get some efficiency or decrease burnout in a provider. Because when I'm delivering a skill and have a patient put on their headset, I can finish my note um, and I can have more efficient time or I could see another patient while they're having their skills delivered instead of me droning on and, or they might get better faster. Um, so I think they're more indirect costs at, at this point, um, efficiencies technology difficulties so there's perceived and real um technological difficulties and um you know um and disenfranchised um persons there's unequal division of technology some people um you know don't have the internet they don't have a phone they don't have access uh design um and then security concerns real and perceived we've got uh many uh, many startups that come to visit us they just don't have any clinical um, background. They've just extrapolated the needs and they haven't collaborated in a research setting or with any clinicians of any type. And then the um, side effects. So right now we can only really deliver 20 minutes uh, of uh, an XR experience because of the risk of cyber sickness and, and the sensory motor and, and all the things that we actually don't know. Uh, there's gamers that play um, you know, have embodied hands all day and then wake up the next day and can't feel their hands for several days. So uh, because it's so new, we don't know the risks. And so we have to be very conservative. There are ways to get over that, this, especially with cyber sickness, but that still needs to be developed. So maybe I'll pause, um, pause here um, before I go on to my study. I guess we've got a few minutes for my study. Um, any questions about, you know, I went over. Yeah, it doesn't, um, we don't have any questions yet. So again, I'll encourage the group um, to either use the chat box or the Q&A box um, at the bottom panel of your screen. But I do actually have a question. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, now that, you know, with COVID-19, we're all virtual and a lot of, you know, healthcare is being delivered virtually. And so I'm curious what, implications you've seen um, at the virtual reality clinic at Stanford on, you know, how that, how, you know, patients are coming to you and you're having to do these telehealth visits and the impact that has on kind of this VR or XR treatment for your patients, if any. Yeah, well, um, it's put a little bit of damper, but actually really not too bad on the virtual reality um, clinic because even though we offer virtual reality, you know, therapy, if you're a therapist, you know there's a lot, there's a beginning and a middle and an end and a lot that goes on and, and agenda setting and relapse prevention. So only a small portion of that um, actual psychotherapy is the exposures with the VR. Um, so, and we only have three headsets. So I can only send it to the most three people at one time to do. Um, so it kind of limits who and when uh, they can do the the VR um, exposures, um, and so um, I think that's been um, one of the biggest impacts. But um, but to be honest, it hasn't been too too hard because most of the time, by some, by the time somebody's done, um, and we don't have a huge number of patients um, that are waiting. So so far, it hasn't really interfered with anybody's. But it could, I guess, potentially interfere with if they had to wait for their headset remotely. But we could order more, I guess, but there would be some cost involved. Um, yeah, is that answering your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. And I have, like, I would really like to do some, I would like to have a more immersive experience patient and have a 3D um, experience or an embodied experience, but, there's no platform that I've been able to find that's HIPAA compliant. And I have some vendors that have shown me th some things, but they're quite crude. So like, I would love to have uh, meet a patient in high fidelity in the game, but it's not HIPAA compliant, but it would probably enhance the treatment a little bit. Um, so I think the other thing is there's just, there's not any um, products out there that would serve our, our purposes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So I'll just briefly go over some of my research. So I told you a little bit about conversion disorder. So that the last 20 years, that's sort of been the, um, been my uh, research population and, and from neuropsychiatry, um, what I've been most interested in. And we've developed group therapies. And then I got into this virtual reality because of, because of this population. But there are, um, it is not medically unexplained symptoms. The, this is quite different. So neurologists from all types of subspecialties have actual um, markers that tell them this is a functional illness. Uh, for example, uh, epileptologists if, uh, will have, um, when they do an EEG, if a person is having a seizure um, and the negative, they have a negative EEG, that's pretty much the gold standard that this is a functional illness. Um, for movement disorder patients, there's things like entrainment or distraction of the movement um, that doesn't happen in um, other organic uh, situations. So there's actually evidence of it's a positive, it's not a rule out disorder. Um, and uh, so this is the population that I was most uh, interested in trying uh, mirror therapy. And, and it makes up about 16% of uh, neurological um, uh, practices. So it is pretty much a bread and butter um, diagnosis in most neurology practices. It's very ubiquitous. And it also is, you can have both epilepsy and non-epileptic seizures um, that would be considered a functional. So we wanted to find out whether virtual reality was uh, feasible in this uh, population to deliver and whether there was any signal in a small uh, uh, randomized controlled trial, um, if there was any signal of efficacy. So we are halfway through the trial. We had to go on hold because of the COVID, um, but we've gotten through 15 adults that were recruited from our neuropsychiatry clinic. Uh, we have pretty loose exclusion criteria. We wanted to be as much like the wild and a naturalistic uh, population as possible. And uh, so we've got an experimental arm and a control arm. So the control arm is a VR experience, but it's non embodied, but it's still interactive. So you play a game and things grow. Um, but the VR experience um, uh, is an embodied experience. Um, and uh, um, patients are um, depending because it's a heterogeneous, there's very different symptoms in, in different patients. So we, if they have um, some abnormality in one of their limbs, we will mirror that limb as we mirror the entire completely. So if they have an upper extremity, this we would mirror the upper extremity and have them pop balloons and do fine and gross motor uh, details. Um, so the that's for all eight sessions in the experimental arm. Um, in the first four sessions, we only do mirror therapy. In the second four sessions, we add on an exposure therapy using YouTube 360 videos. So we customize what their trigger is. So many patients with functional neurological illness, they might have excessive movement or lack of movement, maybe when they have bright lights or when something emotional happens or when they're in a small hallway, it's very idiosyncratic. So we, we get them to, they can find a trigger and if they can, then they um, expose themselves to that trigger. Um, and so if you really wanna um, know the details of the midpoint uh, results, um, you can, it's been published in the journal Neuropsychiatry and Clinical Neurosciences. Uh, we did not, we wanna remain agnostic since um, this is still, um, a study that's ongoing, so we did not statistically analyze anything, just descriptively in some graphs. Um, uh, and I, I want to remain agnostic, uh, but there did at, it does look like uh, at least in a graphical format. Again, we don't know if this is statistically relevant. Uh, there was some um, change in the treatment group looking like they had less um, in the primary outcome measure of um, hand, Oxford handicap. It looked like there was some improvement at session four. Um, and so we don't know if this is an extinction pattern from mirror therapy, which often happens around the third or fourth session, 
or whether just the addition of exposure therapy. Maybe the mirror therapy didn't work at all, and it's only the exposure therapy that was working. We, we don't know. Um, and then to complicate matters even more, which is uh, <laughs> the, the startup that we were using that was customizing some of the mirror visual uh, feedback that made it even more um, immersive and customized with some of the fine motor, they went under. And I thought at least my, I could use their software, but somehow it self imploded. So I am looking for a new vendor. So that's kind of another issue with industry um, and working with startups and innovating. I think that's important. Uh, so we had to put this one on hold because it's through um, immersive um, embodied technology using the HTC Vive, HTC Vive that a provider has to be in the room with them so because of the fall risk. But we have another trial that we were able to easily co convert over to telehealth, which is this behavioral activation. So we're sending patients their headsets and um, trying to stimulate um, pleasant and masterful activities and seeing if it has any effect. Um, so um, I guess that, yeah, that's, that's it. If you would like to be involved in our um, psychiatry consortium, so in doing this, I, I realized that everything came about as just conversations and everybody's trying to support each other. So we, we um, created this consortium where stakeholders can get together informally without signing NDAs and conflicts of interest or making any big time commitments um, in, a month, in, a, in a monthly meeting. And it's been so informative. We have people from all sorts of disciplines all over the world um, just helping each other. Um, and if you'd like to join that, um, you can contact me in my email and it's called SIPC, which stands for Stanford Psychiatry Immersive Technology Consortium. And we have demos there and pre-COVID, we would also try out things, which was kind of fun. It made, it's usually on Fridays and it was a nice end to the work week. I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, any questions from the group before we wrap up? Um, take a moment and pause here. And people can feel free to um, also email me with any questions. And okay. Um, well. My colleague, Christina, is going to launch a poll um, as we close out our time together. Um, so please take a minute to take that poll. Um, this will just help us better understand how we can continue to support your efforts um, in providing care differently. Again, this webinar was recorded and we'll be sharing that recording with all of those who registered and attended um, today uh, in the next few weeks. Um, to sign up for other webinars, including a webinar coming up at the end of the month um, around using virtual reality to improve patient care, um, go to our website at www.chcf.org slash CIN. So thank you again so much, Kim, for the great content um, and for sharing your research. And um, we will see you all in the next webinar. Yeah, thank you all for everything you do, too. Thank you.